Hi, this is Chris Ballou from the Presidents of the United States of America and Casper Baby Pants and just plain old Chris Ballou. And you are listening to No Good Music. One, two, three, four. Hey, Chris. Hi there. How are you guys? Good, good. Good Good afternoon to you. How are you doing today? Thanks. Well, it's, it's, uh, what is it? 10 a.m. So it's morning here. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Where are you? I'm in, I'm on Vashon Island. Uh, it's a little island southwest of Seattle proper, um, which is where I live. I'm Mike. I'm Jim. (laughs) Welcome to No Good Music. Uh, (laughs) Thank you. I was just looking on the uh, uh, on my phone, uh, and I saw a new word for me, and that was Vashon. So it's an island. Yeah, Vashon Island. It's uh, it's great. It's a really um, excellent community of artists and musicians, and just all around excellent people. And in a rural setting, so it's it's like uh-huh. left leaning, <clears throat> left leaning, creative, and lots of trees. He's in Woodson. Uh-huh. Um, everything, a, everything we love, Chris. <laughs> yeah, and, a, and you have to take a twenty. You got to take a twenty-minute ferry ride to get here. So, um, oh really? You got to, you got to want to be here yeah, a little bit. Mm-hmm. About twenty minutes. It's not the biggest deal, but you know, just enough, just enough to keep. Yeah, just them. enough to separate the pretenders <laughs> from the. <laughs> the how, how big is the island? I mean, you have you have stores. Um, and stuff, it is. Right? Yeah, I had this memorized at one point in relation to Manhattan. I think it. It's a Manhattan and a half. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's, very good. It's, very good. it's it's a it's like um, I think at this point eleven thousand year round residents, and in the mm-hmm. summer it goes up to about fifteen thousand. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's no, not many at all. No, yeah. That's great. No, we live in a great little like you know uh, spot with very few houses around, and I go into town. I'm always like, wow, look at all those houses. They're just like house, 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 house. Mm-hmm. house they do it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so you don't have to put on the going, sunglasses and everything when you go into town. Uh, <laughs> I do anyway. I put, it, I put on like a hood and glasses, and you know, have put on a wig. Juice, try to look, like, yeah, try to look like just to look like somebody's famous who doesn't want to be recognized. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> who is yeah. that? Yeah. Who is that? It's like a giant <laughs> arrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have a new album coming out. Uh, yes, January. I do. January Thanks for 13th. noticing. <laughs> We're going to start. To, we'll talk about that first. Uh, Working chronologically backwards. Bone by bone. Okay. Fourth solo album since 2021. Yes. That, so you put out four albums in the last couple of years. That is a lot of writing. It is. It's, yeah. I mean, uh, it, the pandemic really caused me to stop. Uh, I, I think this probably the case for a lot of creative people who are sort of Mm -hmm. on a, um, you know, path. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I was humming along doing music for for kids and parents as Casper Mm -hmm. Baby Pants. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, I was I remember sitting down at the end of 2019 and thinking, looking at my schedule and thinking, I need a year off. I just Mm -hmm. need because I'd been going hard. I had at that point, I had 16 Casper Baby albums out. Wow, I wow. was I was approaching 1300 shows with Casper over the last wow. 10 years, 12 years. Yeah, it was it was a machine. It was going. It was really mm-hmm. satisfying. I mean, it was a classic DIY thing. I was doing everything mm-hmm. myself um mm-hmm. and really really loving it, but also feeling kind of like you know, this had been a 12 year arc and I was kind of feeling like um uh, I was approaching some sort of conclusion, maybe, and then the pandemic hit, and I had to stop. And then yeah. that really made me kind of like settle. I did mm-hmm. go on during the pandemic. I made and released three Casper Baby Pants albums just to kind of mm-hmm. like clear the decks, make sure I'd said everything I needed to say. So I got up to album nineteen. Wow! And then once those were done and released, 
I dismantled my studio and I thought, you know, I'm going to take advantage of this shutdown to really shut down and just just zero out. I went into the studio every day and played piano, played guitar, but I took the uh, goal-oriented aspect of music creation out of the picture. I just wanted to be present in the moment mm-hmm. playing an instrument. That was something that actually with the presidents, when we became a big deal, I lost the ability to just sit and play because mm-hmm. my mind was racing yeah. trying to think yeah. is that a hit is that yeah. the thing i need oh, to yeah. towards Should the next goal in? right yeah. Yeah. yeah i don't want to let yeah. the gold slip through the uh <laughs> slip through the cracks yeah but and then it really took me like five years to re-approach being present and it was kind of scary it was like i really could not just sit and play music it was mm-hmm. very weird well being around so, kids anyway. being around kids and performing for them i mean that's active you know that whole you know, staying active, active, you know, to, to play for, to perform for the, the children, you know, and, and that's your focus. That's, uh, it's always active. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> yeah. a, that's yeah. a big, yeah. big industry though. Yeah. Children's books, children's music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And think about over the period of that time, mm-hmm. you're getting new people because kids, you know, get well, older. The first children and, that you you sang to, they're now adults. You know, they're going, they're yeah. graduating college and stuff. But adults can listen <laughs> yeah, to the music it. too. Baby drives well, a car. Yeah, I love I mean, that song. Oh, which which one? Baby drives a car. That is just <laughs> baby driving a car. I baby driving it. a car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Baby's driving a car. Baby's driving a car. Baby's driving a car. Baby's flying a jet, baby's flying a jet, baby's flying a jet, baby's flying a jet. As high and fast as a baby in a jet can get. Baby's on a motorbike, baby's on a motorbike, baby's on a motorbike, baby's on a motorbike. Past the speed of sound and the speed of light. One of these days this baby will slow down, one of these days this baby will chill out, but that day is not today. What about now? Thank you. Thank you. I'm pretty proud of that one, too. I, I dig that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, if we want to dive into the Casper thing as a prequel to the solo stuff, that's great. Uh, so it's yeah, it was really born out of kind of a uh, imp- like a gut feeling I had the entire time the presidents were happening where I had this message coming from somewhere saying, congratulations on your success, but you mm-hmm. are not done. This is not your final destination. Yeah. And I'm thinking, really? Do I have to? You know, can I just hang out here for 50 years? <laughs> and, the, yeah. and the voice was like, "No, keep going." So anyway, I kept, I kept digging again for like 15 years on the side, uh, outside the presidents, and um, eventually the experiments. I mean, I started bands, I put out albums, I did all kinds of stuff, and it really none of it was it. And I um, finally landed on this really simple, acoustic, innocent vocal kind of approach. Um, and still didn't know what it was. And then I met my second wife, Kate, and she's an artist Mm -hmm. and her art really, it looked like what I wanted this music. I couldn't quite focus on to sound. Mm -hmm. So I made music that I thought sounded like her art looked and, uh, which is like innocent folksy, full of animals, well, you know, bright colors, character driven, that kind of stuff. And it just like, you know, the, the kids music thing found me. It wasn't a conscious choice. It was something that was like an impulse that I had to, I had to scrape away all this like rock and roll dirt yeah. to get to the uh, yeah. wow. little shiny core. Of I think the presidents had that little core of innocence too. I think our mm-hmm. strength was innocence rubbing up against innuendo, you know, the mm-hmm. friction between yeah, adult yeah. and innocence. Yeah. The kitty, the kitty um, rubbing up against I didn't the leg. Like yeah. <laughs> Well, like, exactly. Can... Yeah, it's it's a kitty and it's cute, but it's it's gonna injure me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I compare the presidents to they might be giants whom, a little bit. Whom we love. Because they went oh, into yeah. children's music too. And when my son was young, that's what we listened to. Mm-hmm. Uh the eight I think ABCs and they did a numbers mm-hmm. album. Why does the they didn't do as many as Casper no. <laughs> Baby fans? No, they but... just touched on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And their stuff was a little more you know, like um I think they angled more towards a little bit older kid. I was really angling towards the zero, zero to five year olds, like okay. the really yeah. innocent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't want to get too musically complex or too lyrically complex. Uh, and I wanted to kind of, so the parents, I mean, 
Mm-hmm. I used to joke when I was doing this full time that I really wasn't making kids music at all. I'm making parents music, but there's no genre called parents music. So yeah. I have yeah. to call it kids music. Mm-hmm. But I really 85% of the time I'm thinking, what would mom and dad want to hear? Yeah. Um, wow. Because my goal was to bring parents and kids into the same room to love and dance mm-hmm. and sing along oh, to yeah. the same song. Genuinely love it. Not like the parents That's are like, all right, I'll, you know, That's I'll tolerate this. That's a great yeah, goal. Yeah. I wanted that Casper Baby Pants thing to be a tool that parents could use to alleviate stress, to alleviate boredom, to make long car rides more tolerable, like functional on the ground, feet on the ground, parenting assistance is what I was mm-hmm. really trying to offer. Because mm-hmm. we had a group that we, uh, me and my first wife, Mary Lynn, participated in called PEPS, Program for Early Parent Support. And it was all about mm-hmm. parents getting together to uh, talk about their stresses and fears and, you know, mm-hmm. be connected as a community. As a, anyway, so that underlie that whole thing. So anyway, flash forward, I do the Casper thing, 10 years, 19 albums. Mm-hmm. Um, I take nine months off, dismantle my studio and out of that silence. So about a year and a half earlier, I, I had this other, other premonition, kind of like the kids music was floating on the horizon, but I mm-hmm. couldn't tell what it was. This new kind of music was floating on the horizon. It had abstract lyrics and it was groovy and it was funky and distorted mm-hmm. and fuzzy. And I told friends about it, like there's something hovering out there. But it took like a year and a half for it to actually bloom or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turned out to come out of this quiet place I got to during the pandemic. I'm just playing. I'm, and what I'm playing is kind of repetitious and trancy. And, and uh, it's not about being as much pop song craft as just basking in uh, chords. I used to listen to this band, The Spacemen 3, back in the day. I don't know if you guys know them. And no, this no, no. English band called... Well, there was this whole, there's this whole genre of just like fuzzy, repetitive, trancey, mm-hmm. you know, uh, psych rock, I guess you'd call mm-hmm. it. And um, anyway, that sort of started to bubble up. And then I looked back at my, you know, thousands of song fragments that I've kept over the years. And sure enough, there's tons of little seeds for new songs in all that. Going all the way back to 1981. Wow. I started finishing <laughs> wow. songs that I had written as a teenager uh-huh. and didn't really understand what I was doing. And, I, you know, I was singing with a terrible fake English accent because I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a story, but anyway, story, the story of going back to many bits. That sounds like uh, Claude from Anything Box, uh, you know, make, mm-hmm. having a hit in the 80s, uh, coming and founding all those bits, all those pieces mm-hmm. and creating uh, similar to the style you're talking about. So, uh, yeah, very interesting. Have you yeah. heard of any, Anything I'm sorry, Box? I've never heard of that. No. Oh, OK. East Coast. They're 80s. <laughs> okay. They had, they had like one. I'll check it out. Yeah. It's yeah. it's called Anything Box. What is yeah. it called? Yeah, Anything Box. And yeah. currently making music. Claude, what is his surname? It's just Claude. Okay, S. Claude. Claude S. Sterilio. <laughs> Claude, yeah. Claude Sterilio. Yeah. Yeah. I called him Claudio okay. Sterilio yeah. back in the 80s, but enough of that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, keep, uh, yeah, keep yeah, going. Yeah. So, uh, this quiet so place, it, playing the, tr- uh, the uh, repetitive music. Uh, uh, yeah, kind of a meditation, kind of an ongoing, enjoying the chords, enjoying the music. Yep. And simultaneously, I have been doing something called Qigong for years and years and years. Uh, it's like a breathing meditation, kind of yoga ic movement. I do it every morning. I do an afternoon meditation every day. So I'm clued into that. And then I started listening to this guy, Ram Das. He's an amazing uh, psychedelic pioneer. He took uh, psilocybin with Timothy Leary, who pioneered uh, the LSD popular, mm-hmm. you know, movement back in the mm-hmm. 60s. In 1961, uh, when he was Richard Alpert, he took LSD at Harvard with uh, Timothy Leary and did the um, uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment, which was a big experiment with giving LSD to prisoners. And mm-hmm. anyway, it was it, it, it's a whole story with him. But he ended up going to India and finding a guru and doing all this stuff. And he's got amazing lectures online about just the experience of being a human being who is alive (laughs) and (laughs) has to negotiate the curriculum of being human. And I found myself listening to his lectures and just going, yes, yes, yes. I know that already. I know that. I felt that. That's exactly what I'm kind of um, getting at when I meditate and do my thing. So anyway, Mm -hmm. thematically, lyrically, now I'm pulling from all this like language of self-awareness and um, being human and being conscious and all that, just the abstraction of being alive. And that's really been fun for me because 
typically with the presidents and Casper and everything else, I've been very like character and story driven in the songs. Mm -hmm. And I've always kind of envied people who are more lyrically impressionistic and kind of abstract and I'm more like toying with emotion and emotional um, story kind of thing. Uh, painting pictures with emotions. So now I've kind of found that voice in my lyric writing and in pairing it with this kind of uh, repetitious uh, music is fits. And lo and behold, just like Casper, when I found my purpose and my palette, this volcano of uh, songs exploded. Same thing's happening here. This is album four coming out mm -hmm. uh, this Friday. Yeah. I have four more records recorded, mixed, and sequenced <laughs> wow. sitting. You went wild. <laughs> and, another, <laughs> and another 55 songs in process. And I just wrote a song yesterday. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> so wow. it's funny what I roll. find in life. Yeah. Well, with the presidents, with Casper, with mm -hmm. solo stuff, when I find, again, when I find a purpose and I find mm -hmm. a palette, Mm -hmm. It just explodes. And I don't know how long this one will go, but I'm sure there'll be another one waiting when it's over. So that's kind of right, what so, I'm doing. I'm doing these arcs. Yeah. So as you're writing now with the solo stuff, it's not really the goal isn't, is this a hit? But it's more of, like you said, emotions. All emotions are true and all emotions are correct, whether they're, yeah. <laughs> whether you like them or not. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, song, exactly. There's, yeah. There's the dark side of everything and the light side. So it's, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's, that's, there's a different goal. It's, it's to bring something out of yourself and there it is. Yeah. It's not. What yeah. People are and you know, it's, it's, it's really settled as far as how I relate to the music and the, you know, you know, before the presidents, I really was super content. I wrote songs. I recorded them on my four track. I busked in the streets and on mm -hmm. in the subways. I sold my little cassettes as I bust. And I was like, yeah, this is it. I'm fine. This is a total DIY successful circle. And then the president's did this thing and it was really fun and everything, but it was also kind of disorienting and confusing because I got away from that. I got more into like music as a commodity and it's just taken a long time to dismantle that. But now my mantra is nobody cares. I'm just making chairs, <laughs> <laughs> meaning analogous to like a guy who has a job and in the on the weekends I go into my wood shop and I make beautiful chairs but I'm not selling chairs I'm not trying to impress anybody with my chairs I'm just making the chairs cuz mm -hmm. the chairs are fun to make yeah yeah you're happy doing what you're doing yeah I'm making these albums because I want to hear them basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I put them up Spotify Bandcamp that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know people seem to dig them um but I'm not if I get over my C's and I start thinking like, oh, it should be huge. You know, this is a hit. Just go. Nobody well, cares. Well, the music I'm industry is is a lot different than when. Yeah, you know, it's changed so much. In, from the 90s. So, yeah. you know, good and bad because you can, you can record in your house and put out an album. You know, you don't have yeah. to look for a record contract or, you know, you can just do yeah, it it's, on your time. It's a dream, man. I mean, I don't know how, you know, with the presidents, we really had a hard time finding our identity in the studio. We knew mm -hmm. who we are. Mm -hmm. We knew who we were live for sure. Mm -hmm. But then it came to the studio and we're like, well, do we capture what we do live? Or is this our opportunity to maybe paint with more colors and add instruments and be more? And we never really as a group, it's a big ask for a group to find the trust and vulnerability to take chances and like the Beatles did. I mean, if you watch the mm -hmm. get back thing, the yeah, time they, they spent oh, yeah. stretching songs, being weird, being embarrassing in front of each other, being mm -hmm. stupid, you know, silly, yeah. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet teasing out something real, that's a huge ask. And I think in the end, I kind of uh, have settled on the realization that I was never supposed to be in a band at all. Like being in a band was really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The you solo know, thing I, is, is right. where you're headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about working solo and uh, is that if in the end, if the drums aren't working or they need to be different, or if there should be no bass or if the guitars need to go away, mm -hmm. I don't need to explain that to a bruised ego of a bandmate. Yeah, I nobody's going to get and, angry at you, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's all like I'm so focused and in service to the song. I don't care about who played what, you know, mm -hmm. and that that just gets really difficult in a band situation. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, uh, okay. you know, like you said, making the chairs, you know, we we're all we're all uh, making our own chairs and doing different things. And uh, I don't care if anybody is going to like this chair. I'm going to make this chair the way I want it and make it quality. You know, this, yeah, I don't yeah. care if anybody likes it or not. Yeah, yeah. even if nobody needs to sit down, I'm just going to make this chair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, that is part of it too. Like I've slowed down, and I'm really like enjoying the craft of recording, and um, you know, getting more um, uh, strategic with like charting out background vocal parts and just getting really relaxed and into it. I used to like with the Casper thing. I still hadn't quite accessed the relaxed present thing. Mm -hmm. I would get, I'd work for 12 hours straight without taking a break or having a drink yeah. of water or anything. And, uh, it was not feeding it was yourself. So yeah. You're not, you need to get a drink. Yeah. You need to relax, <laughs> take an hour break. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wow. I was just so excited. There was one time I, I did take a break I went in the house <laughs> and I opened the refrigerator to get something to drink. And there's a song on my second Casper album called nine 99 that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of a crowd for it turns out uh but i opened the fridge and the song just like dropped into my head and i started singing this little soul of mine is 9.99 and i just went, <laughs> I, closed, I closed the fridge went back to work and recorded it start to finish wow. and mixed it and everything and that's the version that's on the album and i never got the water i never got anything to drink <laughs> yeah. wow i i will listen to that i will look for that 9.99 yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so are, are you doing a tour in support of the new album do you do solo no no you know the other big revelation i had i was playing a lot of shows as casper baby pants and i did of course all shows with the presidents and um the other thing that happened when the pandemic hit and the shutdown happened is that i had a full slate of shows ready to go for 2020 mm -hmm. and i remember looking at that like i said i kind of looked at my schedule and went i need a year off and a yeah. lot of it was i need a year off a rigmarole because again i'm doing these shows diy i was bringing my own pa i was the you know i was the stage tech i was the sound guy i was the performer i was the merch guy i was the accountant <laughs> while it was really fun and fulfilling it was great but then when it went away i felt this profound sense of relief relief and that's what you're gonna say it yeah yeah i got me examining like well what's my relationship to performing now like why do i feel so relieved and then I kind of realized there's a lot of stress with performing. And I'd kind of mm -hmm. put myself through a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun and everything, you know, like it's like golf, you know, every 85th time you swing the club, you connect with the ball and you're like, I love <laughs> golf. Amazing. And then that, that you know, the other 84, yeah, yeah, the other 84 swings are just like duffers and terrible and flying off to the right or the left. And I hate yeah. golf. I, but anyway, <laughs> so there's the, I, I know that I'm not alone. I know that I'm not alone in saying that uh, uh, I got laid off, lost my job, and uh, it was great. <laughs> the relief yeah. that came in March yeah. of 2020 to to right. not everybody, but mm -hmm. a large percentage yeah. of people uh, got to uh, got to be alone, got to rest, got to take a nap. I um, read a lot of books. Yeah. Yeah. So, stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I realize there's people I don't want to offend. I realize there's people that uh, that are living week by week and they they, they couldn't have that month yeah. off or or whatever it was. But yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, I, I, you never want to belittle the, the downside of the thing. But mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of um, opportunity for people to slow up and uh, examine what's going on. So, yeah, I just you know, I, I kind of right now, now I'm considering myself retired from performing. I'm I'm just. I don't know if that'll change in the future, but right now I'm living on this island. That was another factor. I moved away to ferry ride to get in. So I was kind of like, do I want to be doing two shows a day mm -hmm. in town on the weekends, back and forth? Anyway, that was a smaller factor than the factor that I just, just needed to kind of not be the guy that everyone's looking at to elevate the room and take care of everybody. I just kind of want to be a guy making chairs in his garage, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm kind of retired from performing. It, it would be interesting to do this stuff live. And I do sometimes when I'm recording it and mixing it, I kind of close my eyes and imagine that I'm performing it at a European festival for like 200,000 people. And like, mm -hmm. where where are the parts where people are going to sing along? And, you know, like <laughs> I, I fantasize about it being massive and successful and live and just like, you know, this huge connection that's happening. But it's really a daydream. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I want to talk a little bit about the presidents. And yeah, love to. Now, even though you you've had some hit songs, Lump, Peaches, Kitty, I want to say there's some things in the music business. There's certain points in in the music business where you're like, we've re- we've finally made it, right? And I think one would yeah. be that Weird Al parody is one of your songs. Yeah, that's special. Which is Lump, yeah, you turn well. it into gum. She's in my head. She's love, she's love, she's love, she might be dead. Love lingered last in line for brains, and the one she got was sort of rotten and insane. Small things so sad that birds could land. Is love fast asleep or rocking out with the band? She's love, she's love. I want to know how, how that came about. And I, I know you had sort of a relationship with Weird Al because he directed one of your videos also. Yeah. So just uh, Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about Weird Al? And... Yeah, sure. Um, well, he's number one, he's just the most delightful human being mm-hmm. on the planet. So nice. So uh, what a he's a great, great listener, great conversationalist, really dear, intelligent, talented, amazing human being. And I'm super proud to have him as a friend. He's, mm-hmm. he's we're still buzzing. He's just great. Mm-hmm. So there's there's all the love. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So he not only, you know, for me personally, not only having my song covered, but he he played me in the video, <laughs> which oh. growing up on MTV, you know, watching it. Mm-hmm. endlessly when it first came out and oh, seeing yeah. of course his videos he it just felt like a, a absolute world apart you know like uh someplace i would never get to go as i watched it come on the air in 1980 you know mm-hmm. as a 15 year old yeah or whatever yeah, we did too we're, we're about your age yep yeah we were yeah. I, I was born the same year you were born yeah oh okay 65 de- yeah. i was born in december mm-hmm. okay Later, I was born in May. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm always going to be older than you a little bit. Yeah. A little. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, he uh, his habit is to ask the artist whether they're okay with a parody, mm-hmm. which he doesn't have to, do, mm-hmm. but he does it just because he wants to kind of you know be a good guy and make sure people mm-hmm. aren't going to get upset. Of course, we I wasn't upset. I was like <laughs> absolutely. So he did it, and. Uh, now, this is funny. I did a podcast a while back that was dedicated to talking about Al and his videos. It was okay. Mike Mills from REM, Dave Perner yeah. from Soul Asylum, and me. And wow. we were talking about our experiences with Al. And I told a story there uh, where I was talking about, you know, Al being me in the video. And they're like, well, where did you first see the video? And I was like, you know what? I don't remember, like a <laughs> hotel room or at home. Or, mm-hmm. And I... Uh, somehow talking to Al and mentioned that I couldn't tell them where I was when I just, you know, couldn't remember where I was when I saw the video just in passing. And he's like, wait, a minute, you don't remember. And he told me that he screened that video for me on our tour bus outside oh. of a LA show after the show. It was just me and Al in our tour bus. And he played me the video and it was the only time that he'd ever debuted the video for wow. the artist. In- yeah. Wow. Well, and you and don't remember I that. Can- <laughs> I don't that's remember what, it. And that's well, what adrenaline well, does after a show, you know? Uh, right. uh, I know right. what it's like to be after like a show. That. You're just like, ah, yeah, whatever. Give me something to drink. I'm thirsty, you know? But uh, there's Weird Al in the tour bus with you. That is excellent. <laughs> I know. It's so weird. It's it's scary, though, because it makes me wonder what else am I forgetting? I mean, did yeah, I, you yeah. know? <laughs> hey, I saw a, a video. So, Saw a video, YouTube or TikTok, and there was a bunch of guys in a garage, very talented, large two gar- two car garage, and there was Weird Al playing the accordion. You weren't one of those guys, were you? In the garage, uh, I don't know. Maybe, friend, maybe. Yeah. maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I might have been. They, they 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 pan around, and there's there's the the full uh, you know everything that's in a rock band uh, plus an accordion, and there's mm-hmm. Weird Al playing the accordion, and it was I forget the song, but uh, you know I just thought you could easily have been in there. But uh, yeah. Oh wait, now are you talking about are you talking about the Weezer cover of, of um, Africa by Toto? 
It could have been. Talking about? It could have been. Yeah, yeah but, they, but it was in a garage. Yes, it's a home video. It's well, not a not a music video. It's you know it's home video. Oh, okay, okay. Because there's no, a music video for Weezer's cover of Africa, where mm-hmm. Al is playing Rivers Cuomo, but with an accordion. Yeah, and yeah. And okay. a remake yeah. of the sweater song video, where they're like the camera's swirling around. Yeah, yeah. and it's in a. Oh, yeah, stage, not a, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this was just a neighbor filming it. Look, look at my neighbors uh, playing in oh. a band. Oh, and there's Weird Al on the accordion sitting down on the left. Yeah, there. yeah. but enough about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But Al's a great guy. I did almost one time light his hair on fire. That was um, oh, uh, really? I, I nearly missed being <laughs> infamous for destroying Weird Al's hair. Oh, I'm he, glad he, that you're not fame infamous. Uh, my wife and I visited him and his uh, wife and daughter in L.A. many years ago when her, when his daughter was really little. And he had, I think, not too long before moved into this new house. And it was a big, fancy L.A. kind of house. And it had this um, fireplace that was all blue stone. It was a gas fireplace, you know, mm-hmm. with a, mm-hmm. a, a piece of glass in front of it with okay. a gap between the glass and the fireplace. And I was like, Al, what does your fireplace look like lit up? And he's like, you know what? I've never lit it up. Let's try to light it up. So he, oh, wow. he didn't know if there was a pilot light or if there was an igniter switch or what. And I got the little key to turn on the gas and I turn on the gas and he's in there trying to like turn mm-hmm. something on to make it go. And finally it caught and this big blue ball of wow. fire came out. Because it all packed in right there. Oh. Yeah. And his head is like right in the fireplace. And oh. luckily it just kind of like. Uh, surrounded him and left. Uh, yeah. But it could have been a real bad hair day. Which is yeah, yeah. bad hair yeah. day. Yeah. We we saw uh, Emo Phillips open up for Weird Al. Uh, oh. Probably was that four yeah. years ago, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've met Weird Al it, twice. Oh, yeah. Once was it was at the, it was the Sands in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's now Wind Creek. But I had a friend who did security. And we knew where the bus, the bus parked behind the sands. And there was only like 20 of us. And no pun intended, but it was weird because Weird Al was on the steps of the bus. You couldn't see him, but he allowed one, a picture and one autograph. And you don't see him until you like turn into the steps of the bus and he's sitting there. And then you've got a picture. Of him. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's oh, just okay. a great guy though. Great guy. Yeah. And then I met him yeah. at an autograph mm-hmm. show. We've only got a few minutes left. You, uh, you almost uh, were performing on Saturday Night Live. Is that true? And you, and yeah, yeah, they, they turned it down. Yeah, what, yeah. what is the? We know the reason, <laughs> but yeah, I w- It was my wedding night for my first marriage to my mm-hmm. first wife. Yeah, uh, we October twenty first, two thousand five. Okay. I remember it. Uh, mm-hmm. The date, but. <laughs> Yeah, they offered us, and uh, I remember being on the phone at a hotel with uh, Donny Einer, high up guy at Columbia Records, and he's saying, "We will pay for your wedding. We'll pay for your honeymoon if you move really? the date." This was only wow, like two really? weeks, wow. maybe two. I think two weeks out. And you know, at that point, it, you know, it was, it was a really there. The whole thing was so mixed. You know, it was like all this validation and all this like joy and excitement, but also mm-hmm. all this kind of disorientation and confusion and kind yeah. of having to do things I didn't really want to do and, and yeah. you know, stretching my nervous system to its outer limits by like mm-hmm. getting up at 4 a.m. and getting on planes. And, um, and it just was one of those things where I was like, you know what, I, I'm a person with a life and I'm getting married in two weeks and mm-hmm. I don't want to trade that for Saturday Night Live. So I and that's a no. better story. That is <laughs> a know, better story than if you had played on Saturday Night Live right there. I like that. But I, I thought yeah, I had think, an idea that you could have gotten married on Saturday Night Live. And that would have uh, been. Uh, that, well, here's the thing. Two things about that. Uh, <clears throat> number one, uh, we, I did get married eventually to my second wife during a president's show in front of 1200 strangers at the oh, show box. Wow. It's nice. I got married at a show. And then the other thing is we ended up playing at studio eight H eventually because we were the house band for a week for the Carson Daly show. Mm-hmm. And it's shot on off days in the same studio eight H as Saturday night live. Oh. So we were the house band. We got to play yeah. on that stage. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. so you so did I've actually played on stage. this. Yeah. yeah. I've totally rocked studio eight H. Nice. And uh, <laughs> in front of the <laughs> great story, Chris. So we got we got about six minutes left. In two years, 
It's going to mark the 30th anniversary of the presidency of the United States. Self-titled album. I guess that was your first album with the band. Yep. My question is, are you considering a reunion of some sort? Mm-hmm. Would you, for the 30th anniversary, are you still in contact with the other guys from the band? Where- okay. Number one, I'm not considering a reunion. One of the other factors with the rock and roll band is ear damage. Like okay. my, my ears are pretty toasty. In fact, I'm having a big tinnitus, possibly related ear disturbance today in my right ear. Yeah, so, I'm ringing in my, I, my I don't, yeah. I don't think I really can do another music. I don't, I don't think I want to do music where I need to protect myself against it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying I like kinda, one, one, sh- one show. 30th yeah with the trick, the trick is, is what you're saying it takes it takes with the, the rock and roll band it takes four shows to really okay. get to yeah. the point where you're not just playing the notes but you're playing the songs yeah, yeah. and that's the real, and all that. yeah. every every tour yeah. we went on it was like fourth show ah there it is okay, yeah, okay. Now yeah. so yeah, that's, that's a good point. you know jason jason doesn't play drums anymore i'm really okay. not into performing mm-hmm. you know i but i'm a massive fan of never say never because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay who, who knew i was going to make kids music for 12 years yeah, who yeah. Knew? i had no idea. Are, we are working on releasing with a company called bandbox we're okay. going to reissue our debut album mm-hmm. on vinyl okay and we're reissuing our demo tape that we made to get gigs in seattle on vinyl really so we've got a couple collect vinyl. coming up I, i'm in contact with dave and jason all the time we really are are a band again but all we do is talk about reissue projects and money yeah okay <laughs> you thinking about color vinyl or something yeah a little... it'll be okay. uh, the president's one is gold i think and the um froggy style was the name of our cassette okay uh yeah. and that's gonna be on yellow vinyl and that was recorded with barrett Jones at the same studio where he and Dave Grohl made the first Foo Fighters record oh, right before they okay. made that record. So uh, it's a little connection to history okay. there. Yeah. So do you know a man from L.A. named Beck Campbell? Uh, I know Beck Hansen. Maybe Hansen. you looked it up wrong. I don't know. Maybe. Who goes by Beck? His last yeah. name is Hansen. Yes, Beck. Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, I, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but we were tight. I lived with him. Uh, when we were rehearsing for the albums, uh, that's a whole story, man. That was yeah. fantastic because I got to be next to a fame tornado. He was negotiating. And then I got to go negotiate my own fame tornado. Yeah. So it was like hanging out with him, being in his band, going on two U.S. tours, recording with him wow. uh, was like... It was like uh, it was like school. It was like fame school. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We had amazing conversations about like his trans transition from bedroom four tracker to a major label artist. And uh, I'd love to catch up with him again. It's been mm-hmm. a couple of decades since I've run into okay. him, but um, yeah, he, he looms large in my legend for sure. He's a fantastic yeah. little, little guy. Yeah, There's, there's no one like him, you know, his the, just, uh, you know, even, even the lyrics from loser, you know, his first number one hit, it's just, it's just phenomenal. I mean, even that right there, but just, uh, I love the song dreams. Uh, just can't yeah, get enough of that one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm- yeah, I like nobody's fault but my own from Mutations. Okay, I'll look that up. Great talking to you. Yeah. I, love I, the stories. I I've, loved the, I've loved the band since, mm-hmm. you know, the 90s, and it's Me an too. honor to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so well. thank you, Chris. You love bet. talking to you. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank you. Okay, sounds thank good. So and put, uh, thanks for everything. Put org in there somewhere, so that's where okay. people go. All right. Okay, bye. to No Good Music. Today's interview was produced and edited by Jim Thatcher and recorded via Zoom at the Did You Say 7 
Studios in Washington, New Jersey. You can find No Good Music on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Pandora, and almost anywhere you listen to podcasts. The song Star Map of a Soul, Babies Driving a Car, Lump, and Fade Out were used with permission from Chris Ballou.